So, um, hello everyone, or should I say good afternoon? This is after 12 already. Um, my name is Kalina Figel, and I'm a data analyst from IBM Client Innovation Center in the UK. Um, so, before I start talking about what blockchain is and what it really means to data science, I would like to ask you two simple questions. So, the first one is How many of you are familiar with blockchain? Pretty fair amount, I'm very impressed then. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Bitcoin? Everyone, great. So the reason I asked for um, Bitcoin especially is because blockchain has started as a means of recording and verifying transactions. So it was a main factor of, of success of, of the digital currency of blockchain, of Bitcoin, sorry. Well, if it was success or not, that's a pretty much a debatable question, pretty much for another discussion or presentation, I would say. Um, but however, it has become a lot more than just a way to, to exchange money. So back um, some time ago when I was doing my master thesis, I was um, looking at the factors, the macroeconomic factors that influence the price um, of Bitcoin in China. And many of the researchers there, they, they underlined the concept of blockchain as a disruptive technology which is going to have an impact um, in, in the future. And I was thinking, Yes, as a, as a data analyst, then we do, it's like a data warehouse, right? We're storing the, we do, we have the transactions, we're storing the data, and what do we do with this data after all? So you're probably wondering what this um, digital app is doing there. Um, so how I'm going to proceed with the presentation is I'm going to um, tell you a story about physical and digital transactions, and after that I'm going to introduce step, step by step the, the key concepts of um, blockchain. So if you imagine that we're in a park, sitting on a bench, there is me and one of you, and I would, I, I would like to do a transaction with you. So I would like to give you an apple. So this is pretty straightforward, right? I just, um, we're, we're both there, we don't need any other third person sitting on a bench with us, and we just exchange it, right? But what if we wanted to do the same kind of things digitally, right? What if, you wanted to, what if I wanted to send you the same apple, a digital apple, like online via some channels? We could also still very pretty much do it via, for example, email or um, Facebook chat or, or WhatsApp, or whichever channel you name it. But on the other side, you might tell me, okay, you sent me the apple, but how do I know that this is, this is the same digital apple? So how do I know that you haven't committed a fraud and put it online, for example? and enable thousands or millions of people even to, to download it in the end? Well, that's, that's a fair question. And uh, I, I don't blame you for asking this. So what we, what's the solution for this? Well, we could store this transaction or we could record this transaction on, online somehow. For example, on the ledger. So this is, um, this is another example um, from gaming industry, if, if you want. Um, this is something what Blizzard has done, for example. So if we're talking about World of Warcraft, they had to record some, somehow the, the items that they've got. And this is where the next question arrives. So first of all, introducing Blizzard and introducing this kind of digital ledger is as if we introduce some third person to, to our transaction on the bench, right? Um, so that's the first question. Second question is, what if the, the guys from the Blizzard decide that, <coughs> okay, I'm going to create another <coughs> rare flame sword and I'm going to put it on the ledger? He could do that, and, and because the ledger is owned by Blizzard. So, the black, black one step forward after that, what we could do is to share the ledger between everyone. That would resolve the problem somehow, somehow because everyone will be able to see the transactions and everyone will be able to, to see what, what, was, what was going on. And this is when the two first concepts of blockchain appear. It's a business network and it's a shared ledger. Why is a business network? It's because you can have n number, number of participants in blockchain. Um, and then this is the kind of peer-to-peer -peer or decentralized peer-to-peer -peer architecture because you share it among the nodes, so you share it among those business, business participants called nodes. Um, another concept is uh, it's called smart contracts. 
And this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting one because this is the kind of self-fulfill contract. So this is the uh, rules of the game, um, if you want. And this is something that is pre-programmed in the, in the programming language of, of blockchain. So those, those kind of transactions, when they are triggered, they self-fulfill. Next one is consensus. So to make sure that you've got exact copies of the, all of the transactions and to lower the risk of fraudulent activities, you have something called, um, um, this is when I need to look at my notes once again. So yeah, to, to make sure that, that there are exact copies, you have digital signature. This is when the users, they, they verify the transaction, they said, yes, this is, this is what we've done, this is what we want, and we all agree for the transactions. And the last one is privacy and confidentiality, which means that there are public and private keys to seal the record of the transactions, which are encrypted and hashed and, sell among, um, and sent among the network. So what IBM, uh, how IBM describes it as a, as a decentralized ledger network, which, which means that um, every participant is kind of independent, it does independent transactions, but they're still connected somehow uh, with each other because they're replicated in every single node. So to uh, visualize a little bit um, how um, blockchain looks like and, and what is that all about with this uh, crypto cryptography after all, um, I put a picture from, from The Economist. So if we look at the transactions that we've got, we've got a transaction A, B, C, and D. And this is as an input that we put into blockchain. And then they are translated into an output in a form of unique hashed uh, value of fixed length. So this is something that you've got in the top um, corner. And then what happens with this uh, hashes, they're, they're kind of connected, uh, combined with each other in something called miracle tree. And then they are sent to the header of the block. So what does the, the header of the block contain? This is, as I said, this is the, the hash, combined hash values, as well as the sum of part of the code from the previous block. So this is why blockchain is such secure, because every single block contains part of the code from the previous block. So you can't change it. You don't have such computational power to, to change the blockchain um, because it's all connected to each other. So what is that with the cryptography? We, we also have the timestamp and something called nonce. So this is the, the header becomes a, a part of cryptography, cryptographic puzzle and this is solved by manipulating this, this number. And once the solution is found, a block is created. So one of the first questions that appeared um, to me since I work in consulting is um, why would I invest in blockchain? Why would I change my reliable architecture into, into something like blockchain? So I derived um, four areas, so four differences between traditional database and, and blockchain. The first one is intermediation. And it simply means, this is something that I, I talked about just uh, previously, that you have a record of all transactions which is shared among the nodes, the market participants. And this is kind of, you have the smart contracts which make it self-fulfill. So this is kind of cheaper um, for organizations because you don't have to invest in, in, um, in architects, you don't have to invest in designing the processes um, and, and it, it ends up cheaper. The other one is confidentiality which is uh, definitely something against um, blockchain because this, is, this, this might be as a deal killer for, for some organization. Blockchain is not for everyone, so this is, this is probably the first, the first thing that I should have said, um, and you will see that based on, based on those characteristics. So in a simple, in a traditional database, it is write and read controlled, while blockchain is only write controlled. So uh, if you look at Bitcoin, for example, if you want to enter um, and start doing the transactions, you need to create a wallet. So this is simple as that. And then you do the transaction, and every, everything is, after all, it's, uh, it's visible. Even, even though you do have those um, ID or, or customer IDs and, and this is hashed, then you still see the transactions. 
Um, so some steps, there are some steps to overcome this, for example, trading with several um, blockchain addresses or, or business, several business network, um, networks. Uh, and there are some, there are some other cryptographic um, solutions, but then they're still not going to be the same as a, as a simple database when you can just restrict um, the transactions or restrict the data. Another one is robustness. So this is something also that I, I mentioned before. Well, there are, there are two types of, um, um, let's say, storing uh, the, or data warehouses for, for blockchain. You can, first still, you can put it on every node on every computer, but you can also put it on, on several servers. So this is what makes it very robust after all. Because if one node goes down, or, or, or several nodes goes down, then it's still not a problem, because the transactions are still recorded on other nodes, and then when they go live, but, but after that, then they're sync um, automatically. You don't have to design the process, you don't have to configure, and you can add nodes whenever you want. And uh, the third one, is the, the fourth one is performance, which is still a... Um, something bad for blockchain because it's never, it's, it's never going to be as fast, fast as a traditional database. So why do I think it's so um, important? This is because it's, um, it started, well, started in 2008, seriously, because it started from Bitcoin. Um, but still, in 2015, the World Economic Forum has run a survey among um, IT specialists uh, and data specialists asking them um, how blockchain can impact. Um, I, I know that it's not really visible, but, but I'm just going to read through for you. And they ask why blockchain is so important, and it turns out that 71% of respondents indicated tax collected by government via blockchain in the stats by 2023. And by 2027, around 58% suggested that 10% of the global gross domestic product would be stored on blockchain. Um, so yes, so this, this is, those are the two events. The World Economic Forum also regarded this as, as one of the six um, mega trends for the next decade. And worldwide. Of course, this is not going to happen before the, the government and businesses um, kind of adjust to, to blockchain and adjust to the new technologies, to way of processing the data, to new taxation mechanism, um, and then, um, yeah, this is still a process. So why don't we go into um, an application of blockchain, how, how, this is, uh, how this was applied and how this was used in, in one of the organizations. So the organization that I'm talking about is uh, something called Decentralized Autonomous um, Organization, which means that this, is the kind of this, this term comes from artificial intelligence, and it simply means that you do have the smart contracts, and smart contracts do um, the operation for yourself, so it limits the human interaction in those kind of businesses. Um, so the first one was the, the original one um, with Bitcoin, for example, it should be cryptocurrency then as a category. So this is less loose. Um, this, is, this concept is especially appealing for me because I'm an economist. Um, so this perfectly illustrates the idea of sharing the economy. And those guys who, who created less loose, they, they aim at um, limiting the, the traffic on roads, so, so in a way of using um, the unused vehicle space, so space in the cars. And what they said, that they, they said that they needed at least 100,000 participants to make it work. And I think they, uh, according to my last research, they, they reached that number in some of the US city. And what they do is actually, they're translating, they're looking at social media, and looking at the, the set, no, not the sentiment, but looking at the similarities and, the, and the similarities um, between user and they match it based on, based, based on social media after all. So that generates um, a lot of data, right? <coughs> that, that is kind of potential for, for data analysts. So I'd like to draw your attention to the last one, which is the, the collaboration. 
So um, the idea was to, um, to kind of provide an incentive um, for people to um, to participate in this. It's uh, they created a crypto, also a cryptocurrency called Zeus, and the community um, collectively decides about the reward in Zeus for each contribution. So uh, this is this is again the idea of consensus that people agree. On the, on the concept, they agree on the transaction, and they, they collectively decide how much currency to, to transfer between, between the users. So what would be implication um, for, for um, analytics here? The first one is um, reactive to predictive transformation. Every time I, I think about this, um, I recall Uber. That I'm an Uber frequent user, and in my opinion, what Uber does is a uh, reactive um, analytics. And it's all because, for example, if you do have um, high traffic on the road, then it turns out that the price of the of the ride is increasing. Sometimes it's even four times as high. So it's, it, every time I need to reject them, um, and then so the reason why is that reactive to predictive because. What you can do with, with this information from Lazus is you can actually do some predictive analysis. So, so if there is a traffic or high traffic, what you can do to prevent it or what you can do to, um, <coughs> to increase the number of cars or to solve that problem somehow. And this is what uh, uh, smart contracts would, would help with uh, because this is, this is their, their self-fulfilled operations uh, and they, they will provide, they might provide like a, a facility or fa like the way of facilitating big data and facilitating the transformation between reactive to, to predictive analysis. Um, what about the, the last two? It's consensus data and, and smart data. So consensus data, well, as we said, um, the first two keynote speakers said that around 80 or 90% of our data analyst time is spent of cleaning the data and uh, the data quality or data quality issues. So um, with consensus data, I think in, in smart data as well, we, we do we can solve it, solve this problem to some extent because the consensus data are trusted data. So this is something that the the participants agreed on previously, and uh, and we can continue um, and we we have like a stable set of data and trusted data after all. In terms of smart data, um, this is also a, a new concept um, in fintech. And smart data is, is again quality data as a subset of, of big data. If you want to, if you want to name it, is without without the noises, they're, they're kind of structured. So I think blockchain could also provide this kind of structured, trusted, and stable data for, for data analysts. And that would, as I said, that would uh, blend the data quality issues. So what are the limitations? Um, if you are looking at Lazus, um, for example, I was, when I was doing a, a deep research about this and I found that um, initially they stored the data on the server, a couple of servers, and then they, they were moving uh, gradual, gradually into blockchain and, uh, and they said that they, they're going to store again they're, they're going to have a couple of servers and they're going to store all this data on the servers. But on the other side, they said that transactions will be only seen between the, the market participants. So even then, they're not going to have the access to, to all the transactions. And this is, I think, a, a threat for, for data analysts and data scientists because it, it turns out that blockchain cannot process those data. Well, it, it processes its data, but it's not visible for us. Then, then how, how are we going to... Um, processes and how are we going to analyze those kind of data. So this is a threat. <coughs> and if more companies are using blockchain and if more companies are using it and hiding the data, then it's going to be even like a, a bigger problem after all. There are other limitations, for example, a limitation of throughput to seven transactions per second. If you compare it to, to Visa, uh, Visa processes around 2,000 transactions per second with an upper limit of, of 10,000. And blockchain is, is just, an uh, uh, average is one transaction and an upper limit is, is seven transactions. 
What can we do to overcome this problem? Well, we could, um, for example, extend the, the size of, of the blocks. But this is again something, something challenging because the data in the traditional database can be compressed, but you can't compress the same type of data on blockchain. So this is a, an, again an opportunity for developers to, to develop an, an algorithm for compressing data. So we probably need to ask the guys from Silicon Valley if you're familiar with this series. Um, and the last one is the countering uh, vulnerability to 51% mining attacks. So in here, how it works in, in Bitcoin, um, for example, is you have miners who do, who do um, process those algorithms um, and dig the, the currency or mine the, 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 the cryptocurrency. And then there is a very limited um, amount of those miners. So if it turns out that the, the, someone owns more than 51% um, percent, um, of, of, the, of the network, then it turns out that you can, you can easily manipulate with blockchain. And this is something to, to be overcome, pretty much. So what's the solution? Um, there are some companies who, who are developing um, blockchain, and one of them is something called BigchainDB. So it combines um, um, digital, so it combines uh, Bitcoin blockchain and the distributed um, database. So what they do um, is, I think they can process one petabyte uh, of data and they can process um, up to one million transactions per second. So this is the extent to which you can um, develop blockchain after all. So this is the immutability, no central authority and asset over network of blockchain and the throughput latency and capacity from, from a distributed database. So uh, um, you can look at blockchain as, a, as a, an opportunity and as a threat at the same time. <clears throat> but you can, you can see that this is a pretty much disruptive innovation. So this is something at, at which um, the governments uh, looking forward to implement because, well, as I said before, if, if you don't care about the, if, if, well, on the other side, if you if trust and uh, stability or data redundancy is not an issue, blockchain cannot do anything else except that. And this is, I think this also um, includes the idea of, of the smart contracts to some extent because I could risk and say, okay, so, well, SQL can do the same. You can retrieve the data, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but on the other side, SQL, you need a human interaction. So this is something that is, is, is missing here. Um, and as I said, this is, this, uh, is again, uh, anonymity and security. Security because of data redundancy, because the data is actually replicated everywhere and it stays in sync after all. And then it's still anonymous because all the transactions are, are kind of encrypted and, and it's, uh, it's presented as a hash. So you don't really see. So if you look at Bitcoin, for example, and, and uh, Bitcoin blockchain, there is a uh, website which, which you can look at, and you can look at the transactions there. You can see where the transaction was done on the map. You can see the hash value, but you can't really look at the user. You, you, can't, you don't know who the user is. And as I said, um, it's opportunities and threats at the same time for, for data analysts and data scientists. So as I said, um, I, I started from questions and probably will finish with a with, um, question to you. If there is anything more uh, that I missed and there is any impact on, on other areas um, for, for analytics. Thank you very much.